All right. So once again, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for some numbers walk into a language class with Abby Rosa and Liddy Rich. Uh, this is a, a virtual version of a really well received workshop that they presented at the Language and Literacy Institute back in January, which seems like ages ago when we could all get together in real life. Um, from our team today, uh, supporting the webinar, we have uh, we have Abby, who's waving to you now, um, Liddy, um, our, our other presenter. Um, you met Gail a moment ago, and we've got <laughs> uh, Patsy. You were interested uh, or introduced to Patsy earlier. She's our director. And uh, Lindsay Cermak is our numeracy coordinator. So that's our team for now. And I'm going to hand it over to Patsy to introduce our presenters. Hey, thank you. Well, you are in excellent hands this morning. That's what I have to say. So um, many of you may know and love Abby Rosa. She's been a, one of our math education leaders in Minnesota adult education for a long time. And she teaches multiple subjects in a one room schoolhouse setting, loves professional development. She is what we call a PD junkie, comes to everything, contributes to everything. And we just love having her. Um, she is also into student ahas and popcorn, I'm told. So we're glad to have Abby with us this, uh, this morning. And this session was so well received. I was able to see it at Language and Literacy Institute. And along with Abby, we have um, Liddy Rich, who's been an educator since 1993. The first half of her teaching career was primarily with third and fourth graders. She's worked in ABE for the last 12 years and currently teaches English, Math, and STAR, the Student Achievement and Reading, uh, to adult immigrants in North St. Paul. And she's also part of our, um, our leadership team for the state. So we're glad to have both of you here with us today to reinvent this session in a new environment. So thank you for being brave. Thank you for saying yes. And I'll turn it over to Abby now. Thanks for being here, everyone. Hey, guys. Thanks for being here. Um, I also wanted to add to my... Uh, introduction that I am not teaching right now. I, I mean, I'm, my students are uh, incarcerated and we don't have access to them right now. So um, I wanted to be upfront about that because I know that a lot of you are on the ground figuring out how to teach remotely. And um, I've had the luxury of getting to observe a bunch of you and learn that way, but I haven't had to uh, figure it out real time. So, um, okay. So um, we're about to do a fun session on um, uh, literacy and math strategies. But um, Lydia and I wanted to take a moment um, to just recognize how strange the current moment is um, and the kind of strange environment that we find ourselves presenting this session in. Uh, oh, I should say too, I have a terrible habit of speaking too fast. So it would be extremely helpful to me if you would let me know if I am speaking too fast. If you put it in the chat, uh, Lindsay has uh, offered to interrupt me if I'm uh, unintelligible. So that would be very helpful to me. I will try to monitor it too. Okay, so um, Marion Dingle, a teacher, spoke to the National Council of Teachers in Mathematics last night and she said, I'm doing the best I can and it's evolving. We thought that was a good place to start today. Um, we're all doing this in a context um, where many of our loved ones and our beloved students are afraid of getting sick or are sick. Um, are facing loss of income or lack of food or anticipating it. Um, and systematic injustice for Native people, people of color, poor people, which was troubling and deadly a few months ago, is increasingly and more obviously a matter of life and death. We also know that you're working hard at jobs that are not the jobs that you signed up for. Um, and you're learning new systems as you try to teach on them. Um, many of you while providing 24 hour care to family members. Uh, some of us may be hard on ourselves or frustrated that we're not getting these right on our first try. Um, it's hard to balance our best efforts with our knowledge that our students deserve more. Um, um, in our work, maybe we can give ourselves some grace. I'm doing the best I can and it's evolving. We're not going to pretend that the strategies today touch on the, inj the injustices that we all need to address. Um, or that you're going to leave this session with your remote teaching all sorted out. Um, but we know that it's probably not why you, that's probably not why you came. Hopefully it feels good to learn together and figure this out together. All right. Okay, so um, today's session was originally designed to look at strategies that we can um, use 
to when the main objectives of our instruction is about developing language or communication skills um, while using a numeracy activity at the core of that um, lesson. Um, so that's one of the layers and we're going to look, we initially designed this session to look at both the strategy itself and at the teacher moves that we can use to kind of enhance what our students get out of the strategy. Um, uh, but there are now more layers because we tried to rework the session to model some strategies that we can use to do those things while we're teaching remotely. Um, and then there's the layer of numeracy and I wanted to be, Lydia and I wanted to be explicit right up front. And this is some of the feedback we got from the language and lit session. Um, there could be a whole nother session where we focus on the teacher moves to bring the numeracy to the front. Um, and that, that this session is not designed around that, but th it'll be present. And if you want to stay after and discuss that or ask more questions, um, Lydia and I would love that. That sounds really fun to us, actually. Um, let's see. All right. Um, there's going to be a lot of um, kind of um, opportunities to view things that you may or may not be already using. Um, you've already engaged in a Google survey. Um, we're going to use the annotation in Zoom today. Um, we'll hopefully do some breakouts um, and talk about some other um, uh, ways to use tech. And a lot of those are actually from um, learnings that I got from being able to observe some of you today. So for those of you that let me observe your online classrooms, thank you. All right, we are going to look, I don't accidentally close something. We are going to look at the survey that you guys sent. Sorry. Awesome. All right. So we're going to do a little notice and wonder. Hopefully you can see two of your survey answers, the questions in your survey answers. And just um, take a moment and in the chat, if you could add what you notice about these responses. Or if you have a question, something that makes you wonder, you can go ahead and add that. I know some of you may be typing. I'm just going to scroll up so you can look at two more. And go ahead and put in the chat um, what you notice and wonder. And then here's some of the reasons that I'm gonna to have to scroll a little bit on this one. If there's a way to have them all um, show at once, I don't know. Um, I love the ones that are very specific. Uh, one might you need to explain your reasoning when you're talking with your kids. I know uh, I'm not a parent, but I know I've been hearing from a lot of my parent friends that there's a lot of um, explaining things to kids are going on right now. Um, explaining a problem when a boss a mi or a mistake to a boss, um, giving examples, deciding a new place to live with a partner. talking about cultural differences, and then um, looking at vocabulary. And I think actually at lots of places where there are subtle differences, that's such a good example. Giving advice. And then there are a lot of examples that relate back to the classroom.
Awesome. All right. Well, Lydia, I'm going to pass it back to you. Okay. All right. Um, it's helpful to see all of the ways that we are um, using language and math already and using language in our classrooms and how we're engaging our students. So thank you everybody who uh, filled out the surveys. Um, whoops, let's see, let's go that way. Um, so I am Liddy Rich and um, I teach an uh, English language class. Uh, my students are in the CCRS category, probably somewhere in the level of of B. They um, can, you know, get, get information from a text independently at, you know, around a second grade level. Um, they come really wanting to talk and have conversations, but it's really, really hard. And my, you know, at the same time, I have students, of course, like all of us do, some of my students um, are, have never, were never literate in their first language and other students come with graduate degrees from their first country, from their, from their home countries. And I wanted to do some math with my students. And, you know, the range of English is, is large, but the range of math is even larger. And when I thought about doing math with my students, the, I, I couldn't figure out how do I, how do I do this in, in a language class in a short amount of time and differentiate appropriately. And I decided, um, I talked to a bunch of people, I talked to Abby and some other teacher friends and we, I figured out that the best thing um, was what I wanted to do was figure out how to bring math to everybody in a way that was really about having conversations. And so um, I hit on this um, Estimation 180, which is a website maybe you're familiar with. It's a place where um, Andrew Stiddell, who's a middle school math teacher, has come up with piles and piles of pictures that he has created for, uh, with estimation activities. So, um, you know, in the beginning, I sh would show a picture and I would say, talk about this. What do you think? What do you see? Um, and the conversations were, you know, they were brief and um, a little bit ho-hum. And I realized, you know, I, that by, if I could slow down the conversation and, and get some more focus on, um, focus on the different aspects of, of the activity and the different processes that we're doing, that it could be a much richer conversation. You know, teaching is so much about pacing and figuring out how to, um, how to, how to pace. And in, in the real life classroom where everybody is in front of us, you know, we as teachers become experts in reading the room. In um, digital learning teaching, it's, a, it's quite a bit harder. One of my friends said, you know, the thing is in the classroom, we read the room and now on Zoom, we have to read all of the rooms. And so it's a little bit of a different challenge of how to do that, but, um, you know, we're doing our best and, you know, I'm peeking at you a little bit and seeing some of you and some of you can't quite see your faces. We are going to ask you to engage and do some conversation with us, but um, uh, so be ready to do some talking in, in just a couple of minutes. So um, with the estimation 180, I broke it down into, uh, into sections where um, specific questions to ask for each of the pictures. So um, I have five questions that I ask my students and we do it slowly. So the questions are, what do you see? What do you know? What information do you need to find? And how can you find it? And then number four and five, what's your estimate and how did you get there? I asked my students and I'm gonna ask you, we're gonna do this in just a minute. I'm gonna ask you to go slowly. It is often, you know, we see, you, we're gonna show you a picture in a minute. I'm gonna show you a picture of a guy. And the question is, you know, how tall is he? And it's easy to jump right in and say, oh, I know, I have a really great idea, but I'm gonna ask you to hold back on that. And um, notice that's not until question number four, okay? So um, we're gonna look at this picture and um, I can see, let's see, I can see your names, great. Um, I'm gonna put up as many pictures as I can so I can see you. And um, if you have something to say um, to answer a question, if you could raise your actual hand, um, that would be best and, and be ready to unmute yourself and tell us some of the things that you see. So we're gonna walk through this process. We're gonna do the first few questions all together. Um, and then I'm gonna, then we're gonna get you into breakout rooms. So here we go. Um, here is a picture of a guy. And the question is, how tall is this guy? 
So take a good look at him. Take a look at all of, at the whole picture. Um, if you are new to Zoom, you, you are able to move the pictures of me talking or the pictures of the other people here so that you can see things better. Although I'm not sure you're really missing much if your people are on the side here. So first question is, what do you see? Um, Kelly, what do you see? Oh yes, well I see a bush and a fence and I'm thinking I can take the height of fence plus the height of whatever I think the bush is to make my estimate. Great, so you see a, you see a, a bush, a yeah, bush and a, yep, awesome. the height of the fence and put them together. Great, thank you. Somebody else, what else do you see in this picture? Well, there are a whole bunch of people who I can't see their faces. Um, somebody else, oh yeah, uh, Gail, what else do you see here? You have to hit, hit your microphone, please. I see the fence is about waist high, and usually fences are about three feet, so I'm estimating he might be six feet. Wait, 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 hold off on your estimate, hold off on your estimate, but thank you, thank you. You see a fence, great. The fence is waist high. Excellent, you see a fence and you see that it is waist high. Thank you, thank you. Sorry to interrupt you, but we're gonna hold off on the other things Sorry. for a moment. Um, yep, no problem. Uh, anybody else, what else do you see? And, and Lydia, could I interrupt for just one second? Yeah. Uh, a couple people said at the beginning that their webcams are not working. So if your webcam yeah. is not working, you have the option down at the bottom. There's a, um, a reactions. Um, it might have a little smiley face on it. Uh, it might look a little different if you're on a, a cell phone. But um, you can go into reactions and like uh, raise a little cartoon hand that Lydia will be able to see that too if you want to speak. You're not out of the game if you're on. Um... Right. Thank you, Abby. And I'm, I'm not seeing any other at the moment. And you're getting uh, some chat, Liddy. Someone, Elizabeth says that he looks like he's bending his knees. And okay. um, someone you. else said that they think they might see that they're near water, KK. I'm guessing that KK is maybe looking at the horizon and maybe there's water uh, out there. Yep. Cool, right. Maybe back here there's some water and, and the knees are bent. I had never noticed that before. That's great, thank you. All right, so um, we start out with just looking at what we see, and and you know some some pictures have a lot more, some have less, but there's a lot of things here, and um, the next thing is I usually put questions two and three together. What do you know, and what information do you need to find? So um, I'm looking at this as you know what what do we know about the world? So I think it was Gail who was. Um, or, or Kelly that was talking about how tall fences typically are, right? So that's something that we maybe know. We might know how tall fences are, or we might know about these bushes. Um, there might be, you know, other information we would need to find. And um, so what, anybody have ideas on this? What do we know so far? What do we know about the world? What do we know from what we see? Should we, should we, should we type it? Um, I would actually love to hear your voices. So if you, if you, so yeah, Kelly yell it out and then Abby, if you okay. can read anything that people oh, like. I guess I kind of said it before I estimated that the fence is probably, I don't know, I thought it was close to four feet. That's what I thought. And I'm thinking okay. the fence or the bush is three. Okay. Oh God, he's awfully tall then. Oh, I was, my fence, oh, now I know that my fence is too tall. I have to bring my fence shorter. Oh. Great. Yeah, so as we, as we look at it and we look at it really carefully and listen to each other, we can hear some of these you know, assumptions, changes of assumptions. I see somebody's hand and I can't see your name, but please speak, take your... Uh... Hey, this Amy. is Amy. Yeah, this is Amy. Um, Got it. I'm, I'm really wishing I knew what kind of bush that was and um, how tall it usually grows. <laughs> Absolutely, yep. So taking into account, you know, sort of what we know about the world or what we don't know about the world. And those are things that maybe we can find out. All right. So in a moment, um, uh, Gail, who is our master, uh, Zoom master for today, is going to put you all into, um, into breakout rooms. And the way this works is um, she's going to put you into groups of three or four people. And when she hits the button that says go, not yet, Marisa, then uh, you will get something on your screen that says join the breakout group. And um, when you go into the breakout group, I'm going to ask you to answer questions number three and four. Now, I've been using Zoom now for about um, three or four weeks. And I've done a bunch of these. And the, the challenge of the breakout rooms is that you can't see the picture. 
and you also can't see the questions. So the questions that you're gonna ask is, or you're gonna talk about with the people in your group is what is your estimate? And as soon as you have an estimate, you also need to be able to talk about what it is that you saw or how you figured that out. How did you get to that answer? We're gonna give you only about two or three minutes. Um, we will send you the questions, but for if you want, you can snap a picture of that or write it down, but it's what is your estimate? How did you get there? When you get a note, um, there'll be a, in your breakout group, there will be a message that comes on and says you've got about 60 seconds left. And at that point, you're going to need to hit the button again that says rejoin the main session. In your group, say hello to your, your new partners that maybe you know, maybe you don't. Tell them your name, introduce yourselves quickly. But we're going to go kind of quickly on this um, and talk about what is your estimate of how tall this guy is and how did you get there. Great. Um, welcome back. So uh, did you come up with some estimates? What, did, what are some estimates? Unmute yourself and somebody tell us what you what your estimate was and how you got there or you can wave at me that's I'll call on you I nominate Andy to speak for our group <laughs> remember to hit the thanks microphone. so much thanks so much Patsy um, that's not fair Patsy of course it's fair <laughs> hi Christine um, we we looked at it as just a little bit short of six feet that he's approximately double the fence, but not quite double the fence. Okay, so great. Like so you're looking 10. at the height. So you're looking at the height of the of the fence, guessing that that's um, and how how tall are you thinking the fence is? About three feet. Okay, so about three feet, and he is he is. Uh, so you're thinking he's just under six feet because he's a little bit more or a little bit less than double, a little less than double. Great. Okay, thanks. Somebody else from another group. Or you can be like Patsy and nominate somebody from your group. Go, Lindsay. Oh, okay. So um, we said about six feet as well. Um, okay. The suit jacket is what people focused on. That it it ah. it kind of looks like the suit is big on him, and so kind of using that, and then also having prior knowledge of what kind of bush that might be, and that that might be about two and a half feet um okay kind of helped play into it okay and so you're guessing also so looking at about how six did, can you help help me out here how did the suit jacket help you with understanding his height yes elizabeth do you want to say more i just thought it looked like it was made for a taller guy it okay. just looks like a big and tall suit to me. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. All right. Um, one more. Anybody else have an estimate and how did you get there? All right. I'm not hearing a lot of voices quite yet. Oh, wait. Somebody, yes. All right. Well, um, I am going to invite you to uh, join in the conversation a bit more as we get to the next one. Um, but I heard a bunch of different um, ideas. You know, you looked at what you saw, you looked at the different bits of information that you got from the picture and some prior knowledge. In my classroom, I, I would have students, um, I put students in my classroom, I put them at a table. I don't, you know, because we don't have breakout rooms in quite the same way. And I would have them standing up and saying, how tall are you? And, and he's taller than you, or he's as tall as my brother or things like that. Um, I also had one time had students go and get the uh, tape measure and the and the rulers in the in the room and try and do that. Um, and uh, you know, I guess you could go around in your house. In my house, we've got the I've got the measurements of how tall my son was on his on the door next to his room to to take an idea of what he looks like in real life. So, would you like to see how tall he actually is? Here, oops, I'm going the wrong way. I'm sorry. Here is uh, our picture. And here are the answers. So, and he actually is uh, six feet four inches. That comes out to 1.93 meters. And just in case you're wondering, that's also 1.06 fathoms. I don't know who ever measures themselves in fathoms. Um, Patsy, are you clapping or raising your hand? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Great. 
Okay, so this guy, this is actually um, Andrew Stidell. This is the guy who started all this. He started it because he realized when kids would say, how tall are you? Um, he would tell them and he realized that the better way is to actually engage them in a conversation. And um, so uh, I appreciated that. Um, to facilitate this with my students, um, I asked them all of the, the questions, but I also you know, wanted to help them with some of the answers. So I set up um, a set of questions and answers to just give them a little bit more support. So at their tables, when I would do this with them, um, of course, the first time I would do exactly what I did with all of you, I would do it as a whole group um, and, and talk about it. I'd go over these questions and I'd try to model the, I see, I know, I need to find, um, and some of the language that is helpful for answering, for answering these. Um, and they found that having something like this, you know, just having something to hold on to, something to look at, it gave them a bit more confidence in, in engaging in this kind of a conversation. When I've done this online, I have done this in the last couple of weeks with my students. Um, we go over it and we talk about all the questions and we practice a little bit in, in doing it. And when I repeat them back, I try to use this language as much as possible to just give them some of those examples. Sorry, Lydia, I neglected um, to mention at the beginning, um, at the very end of this session, we'll ask you to fill out a survey. When you do that, um, you'll get a link at the end of the survey to a resource page that has these activities, other activities, and it has a link to Lydia's sheet and all of that. So you can obviously take notes, but you don't have to feel like it's a frantic writing everything down. Great, thanks, Abby, I appreciate that. Um, so one of the things I like about this website is that, um, that he's organized pictures often in a series. So you see one picture and then you take that picture will help you in the next couple of pictures. So it gives you some of the information. So in, in uh, the first picture is this picture of him. And then he has a picture um, that actually uh, was the day that he got married. There's a picture of him and his wife. And the question is how tall is she? They're standing next to each other. So you can take, you know, take what you know about, about, about his height and make some guesses. And then there's a picture of few years later, of course, when his child is almost half of his height and how tall is the kid and things like that. So I've got another picture for you. And um, what I'm going to do this time, instead of us talking about it all together, we're going to get you back into those same groups. And we're going to have use the same questions. And I'm going to encourage you to really go slowly. Don't jump to your estimate right away. Talk about, start by talking about what you see. Start by talking about what you know and um, what other information you might need before you get to the estimate. We're gonna give you a little bit longer, but not a whole lot longer, because we've got uh, lots more things to, lots more fun and games to come after this. Um, and, then, uh, and then we'll come back. So I'll give you the picture. Again, you um, unfortunately don't get to spend a long time with this. So the question here is how tall is the lamppost? And I want you to know that this guy is the same guy. This is the same guy we saw just a few minutes ago, so we know something about him. So take a few minutes to jot down anything you want to remember, or if you have a cell phone, you can snap a picture of him and, and the lamppost. And uh, we're going to send you into your groups. I'm going to show you the questions one more time. And Liddy, um, just to interrupt here, I did post a, a, a photo. I posted oh. this photo in the chat. So um, you can click on that PDF and, and download it if you want. And then I also chatted the questions, the five questions. So you should be able to see those hopefully uh, when you go into your breakout rooms. Awesome, thanks. So um, again, here are the five questions or you can get them from the chat. What do you see? What do you know? What information do you need to find and how can you find it? And then finally, after, after you do that, what's your estimate and how did you get there? All right. So Marisa, send them away, please. Uh, what were some estimates that you came up with? What do you think about uh, how tall is the lamppost? Anybody wanna, could somebody volunteer and shout out some ideas here? Uh, Lisa, get your microphone, please. Oh, yep, sorry. Our group decided or kind of came up with around 18 feet roughly because we figured his shadow was approximately a third of the shadow of the light post. Great. So you're going to notice the shadows, um, his shadow, you notice the shadow of the, the lamppost, and in some ways maybe the seeing the shadow is easier than 
figure out how tall he is. If that's a third and a third, then he's about six feet. So the lamppost is about 18 feet. Is that kind of what you that's, got? Yeah, that's kind of what we came up with. Yep, exactly. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Somebody else. What else? Uh, any other? Anything else people have got? Um, I I thought the same, um, but including as four inches, I would put another foot on it, so 19, 18 or 19 feet. Okay, great. So maybe a little taller because he was a little bit more than six feet, so multiply him times three and uh, multiply that times three and we get closer to 19 feet. Great. Excellent. Um, so I, somebody, there was a great question in the chat. Um, I just wanted to clarify about the difference between what do you see and what do you know? So when I think about what do you see, it's really what is in the picture? What are you looking at? I see a guy, I see a lamppost, I see a basketball uh, net, all of those things. So what I see is really just what I see. But what I know is I know that this guy is six feet, four inches. I know that, uh, that if his shadow is going to be in ratio to the shadow of, um, of the lamppost. So those are things that I know. It's more of the facts or the information that I have. I know that there are 60 minutes in an hour. I know um, that there are 12 inches in a foot. Those are things that I know. That's different than what I actually see in the picture. So that's how I distinguish those. Um, all right, so we have a couple of guesses on the lamppost. We're guessing it's about uh, 18 or 19. Let's take a look at what we see. And here we go. The answer is 19 feet, three inches, or 5.87 meters. So nice work. I don't know why that we don't get the fathoms on here, but um, we've got the, the feet and the, and the meters. Excellent. All right. Um, all right, I think. That yes, Abby, you're you're up. All right. So we're gonna do some of that peeling back of the onion and look at what kind of Lydia was doing and think about her teacher moves. Um, you should be able to see on my screen. Well, you should be able to see from my screen a Google Doc. Um, and I want you to think about what you noticed or questions that you have about. Um, things that, that um, in, the, in, you, in implementing this strategy, things you saw Lily do or things you're thinking about for your students in terms of developing academic language and literacy, in terms of numeracy related specific language and literacy, in terms of numeracy content, and then other teacher actions you want to make a note of. And then um, always there are things that you guys think of that I didn't, so I left a, um, other things of note. So the way you're going to get to this Google Doc so that you can actually write in it is you're going to um, go to um, this uh, uh, link, which um, is going to be in the chat because Lindsay is going to put it in there. Um, Zoom has disabled um, the links being live, so you'll have to copy and paste it into your um, browser if that makes sense. So if you have any trouble, let one of us know and we'll help you get there. So Marisa has put it into the chat, so you can go ahead and copy that. That will take you into the document and go ahead in real time. You can type right in there. You may want to. Um, each write in a different line. That was my intention so that it's a little easier to type in the document. Um, but you can go ahead into any section you want to and just start writing things you notice, things you're wondering about sort of the implementation of the activity. So whichever table you want to go into. You have to see people arriving. Google has named one of you anonymous pumpkin, which is very cute. They're all anonymous.
So I'm going to start talking while you're writing, but please keep adding if that's comfortable for you. Um, as someone is noting that the first three questions are intended to help people slow down, and that's an awesome observation. Um, most of us are trained to rush towards the answer, and that's not where a lot of the language development and the rich math thinking comes in. So um, developing this as a routine where students are used to, especially questions one and two being a really rich and um, invested time um, and not rushing to um, their estimate is really, really valuable and um, definitely takes um, partly the teacher being legitimately interested, authentically interested in what their students are saying at that time and just like encouraging students to spend the time there. That's a really great observation. Lots of queuing and modeling people are noticing, scaffolding the language. Yeah, someone said listening to the group's reasoning or, or um, others' responses. So this value of, that's something that I've really noticed for my students that we're used to sort of like a teacher to student, but getting a student to student development of ideas is like another layer that can be hard to foster. Um, so this um, has, some, there has some built in aspects of that, really nice. There's a lot of notes on the mathematical content. Politely disagreeing. <laughs> Love it, yes. Um, and in talking about this activity, I work in a correctional setting. Uh, Liddy, I was like talking about how hard that was and how much work I had to put into that, politely disagreeing. And Liddy was like, I think that might be specific to your setting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, so there's some great stuff in here and you'll have access to this um, document too. I mean, you do have access, you have that, that link. Um, some things that I want to make sure got mentioned um, in thinking about um, the evidence-based writing that students have to do for the GED, um, make a claim, give evidence for it and explain your reasoning. Um, this is a, a beginning setup that takes you to that end. Um, uh, I observed uh, Rita from Harmony Learning Center recently, and she um, was doing that with um, misconceptions students had about how COVID-19 was spread, where they were making a claim, and, it, and this is the same idea, right? What, what have you seen? What do you know? And then what evidence do we have for that? Um, people have already talked about clarification of meaning. Um, I also think, um, and it's hard to judge on Zoom, but um, there's a lowering of the effective filter that it's more fun than maybe some other, other it's more engaging, more interesting, and it's low risk, like there's, um, we're talking about a lamppost and a guy, there's not a high, um, high stakes thing going on. Um, all right, Lydia, was there anything that you wanted to add? Here? Yeah, um, I think that you, you, that we hit on a lot of the stuff and I'm having trouble seeing some of the document, but I think that um, I definitely find that I am able to take a lot of this activity into reading as well. You know, looking for looking for the evidence. Um, you know, what do you see in the text that gives you this idea? Is really the same question as what do you see in this picture that gives you this idea for the for the math? So, um, I I use I try to use the same language on that to overlap on that. Um, that's one thing. And the other thing, you know, that, that we this whole idea about going slowly, um, that it also really builds some interest in what's going on. You know, it builds it builds like people actually end up caring. Um, and um, I'll show you some of the other series that we've done, but even, even when we've been doing it through in, in the Zoom class, um, people you know, really seem to engage in having this thing outside of themselves that they're, that they're talking about. So um, it's been a very engaging thing, and the more we do it, of course, the better people get at it. It takes, it takes a bit of practice, but they're getting there. I wanted to so, mention that, um, the guy who designed the Estimation 180 website talks about having students make a guess that is too high and a guess that is too low before they guess their actual estimate. Um, I personally, um, I guess I'm very risk averse. I don't like get to giving my estimate. I much prefer a high, high and low because it's much safer. I can say like, well, I know he's got to be taller than three feet tall and he can't be 20 feet tall. And that's obviously true and it gives me a safe window and then I can give an estimate in there. And it's also a good pattern for reasoning too. So if you find students don't wanna make a guess or you wanna give them a safer, they don't wanna be wrong, then giving them, well, give me a too high estimate and give me a too low estimate can sort of give them a really low floor to come in on. 
yep. I think that that's that I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, for me in my class, I found that the um, teaching all the language about two something was um, took a lot and was often really confusing. And so um, in the times where we were more in the language part about what too big and too small means, um, my students very often want to think that two means very. Um, and, and that kind of got all a bit mucky. But I do agree that if um, that in some situations that that's really helpful. And so absolutely. So I might I sometimes say may give me an estimate that um, that is not right. That is on the you know the one end or the other. So that's that's helpful. Ivy. thank you. Um, so a couple things, a couple more things I just want to show you, and then uh, Abby's got some other things to show us. So um, estimation 180.com is the name of the website. It looks like this. And um, here is, they're organized by days, so you can just go in and look. Some of them are really interesting to me and relevant, and some of them really are not. So you can find things that speak to you. So uh, here is the series I was saying um, about his height and he and his wife, his kid. Here's the lamppost picture and more height things. They tend to go in in series. The ones that um, have worked really well, uh, I was doing uh, earlier this winter in my classroom, I was doing a lot of stuff with money. So each of these is its own day. So we started out with, you know, how, what is the value of this roll of pennies? Um, that was fascinating. A lot of my students actually don't know the value. They knew the value of pennies, but they didn't know what, how much a nickel is or all of those things. But after you know that there are 50 pennies in a roll, then what does that tell you about nickels and about dimes and quarters? So that was a, you know, a week or two of really interesting conversation. People had lots of experiences with rolls of quarters at the laundromat. Some of them were accurate remembrances and some of them were not, but it was also really brought in real life experience and, and uh, they were able to be experts of some degree um, in the conversation. From here, they, they, he has um, jars of coins. So if we know how many um, pennies are in a roll, what does that tell us about this picture? And if we know what, how many pennies are in this one, then what about, what does that tell us about, I believe these are nickels. And there are a couple more in this series. Um, so I've done, I did a bunch of those and those were interesting. So again, the what do you know comes from what we've learned before or in the case of money, um, what do you know about money? Um, in the series that we've done uh, more recently, we've been working on the toilet paper rolls. So the first question here is how many squares are in a roll of toilet paper? Um, that was a great conversation. The second day was what, uh, how many rolls are in the smaller, how many pieces, how many squares are in the smaller roll? And they had great observations about, uh, well, it's smaller than half, but bigger than a quarter. So it's about a third. And if we know how many are in the big one, um, and they were able to, you know, make some great guesses. And then the last one is uh, the question of this third picture is how long is it? So we're looking at distance. If we know how many squares there are, then can we figure out the total distance? So uh, from here, it actually goes to paper towel rolls. Um, I haven't done those yet, but I intend to. But it builds on the knowledge that they have. And um, each of these conversations in our class takes about, uh, about 20 minutes or so. So longer than I, you know, they could go longer, but I usually try and limit them limit them there. So that's what I got. Uh, and um, I think we're going to go on to stuff, something with Abby here. All right. So you can go to the, So um, we're going to talk about Splat. Um, and you'll have a link for this when you um, get the resource page. Um, Splat is um, a resource online. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce the guy's last name. I think it's Wyborny. So Steve Wyborny has a website. It actually has a ton of free resources on it. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, my students tend to work individually and I had been looking for something that would um, let them do something shared. So it had to be pretty low floor and high ceiling. I take anybody who is in, in our women's unit. So it's a pretty diverse group of students. Um, and I wanted them to have, um, you know, there's, there's value in this individualized, individually paced work. Next slide. And then there is also value we know in having them do something collaborative, even if it's not synchronous, something where they feel like there's a shared task is valuable. So um, I wanted, I started experimenting with things and um, Splat seemed like a really good fit and it has been. You can go to the next slide. Um, uh, it is a really rich task um, and it works for, I've got students, I've sometimes had students in the room in the same group that are um, in one of the lower um, levels of English um, and 
um, have pretty limited numeracy and I've had in the same room with students who have a high school credential and have uh, working on pretty high levels of numeracy and they're able to engage together meaningfully about the task. So that's been really exciting. I also wanted something that was joyful and playful. Um, uh, you know, it can be, class can be grueling sometimes and it can be frustrating and so to have something that is engaging and exciting and, and fun. Um, also, to be completely honest, Splat is free and it is already prepared. <laughs> And I, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. If someone smart has made something really good, then I would like to use it. <laughs> um, and then um, my chicken pot pie story is that I had a student who was working on multiplication and he was working on a raise and a, um, correctional facilities are run on the labor of our residents. So the residents ran, work in the kitchen and other places. And um, one of my students came back from working in the kitchen and he was like, oh, Abby. And he was telling me about this day where the officer had come to him and said, make this many trays of pot pies. And you know, when you put pot pies on a tray, it's an array, right? So he could calculate that it was gonna to be too many pot pies. And he said, he tried to tell her, we're going to waste a ton of pot pies today, there's too many trays. And you know, he's like a incarcerated black man in 2020, like he, the woman was not listening to him. <laughs> and he, I was like, what did you do? And he was like, I baked way too many pot pies. <laughs> but I think the, um, opportunity to not only be able to do the calculation, but to be able to do the calculation and convey to someone else in a meaningful and um, effective way, what, is, what, what your reasoning behind your calculation is can be really powerful in a lot of, of places. And we talk a lot about work readiness. And I think it is a work readiness skill to be able to say, hey, I really screwed up. I baked too many pot pies today. Here's the map I was thinking of, but here's what it actually was. Or to be like, hey, um, Katie, you told me to bake this many trays. Here's how I'm calculating that I think that's going to be way too many pot pies. Um, so there's kind of a value, uh, like a ACES value in them being able to express um, what they're thinking in calculations. Um, and then the other bonus is that I think SPLAT can be done synchronously and asynchronously. And I've done it sometimes synchronously, and then I've pulled a slide and had a student work on it on their own in their own individual time. So I think there's a lot of flexibility there. All right, so um, slide. Um, uh, I think, I don't know, I don't know the man that designed these, but I think these are based on dot talks and um, dot talks are something you can look up. He's got some on his website too. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time there, but if you've heard about number talks, um, then you're probably familiar with them. And if you haven't, it might be something to Google. Um, you can go to the next. Um, so in terms of language and literacy, um, this is probably more I would, than I would put up um, on the word wall, unless I had some pretty um, sophisticated students, but you can probably imagine seeing part of this word wall up, especially just the beginning part where it says um, how many dots um, are how many dot, how many dots are under this flat, and there are. I might start with just that part, and then um, introduce other pieces of the language as I go. Um, all right. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, for this activity, I would ask students to put their pencils down. I know that we're in a professional development training. So what I'll ask you to do is, if you wanna take notes on teacher moves or on something you wanna remember, a way that you would adapt it, feel free to do that. But in terms of um, the engagement as a learner in this activity, if you could not use your pencil for this activity, I think that will make it a richer activity. Um, if you are able to, um, uh, if we can see you, then um, I'm gonna ask you um, when you have an answer, to put your hand on your shoulder or raise or um, put your hand up like this um, or you can go to down to reactions and if you're if you can see my picture um, then uh, you can do I don't care if you use the thumbs up or you use the clapping or whatever you want to do um, uh, to show me that you're ready either way or you can put your hand um, uh, let's see in class I ask students to put their hand on their chest um, and the reason I do it is because um, if a student raises their hand and starts doing this like, oh, 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 or even just shoots their hand up, um, the students around them tend to shut down. Like they're, think, they're calculating and then Lindsay's got her hand up and everyone else is like, well, Lindsay's got an answer. Um, so putting their hand on their chest is a little more subtle. And as some of you can probably um, relate to, I then had to ask them not to quietly put their hand on their chest because they would be like, I don't know if you can hear it, like, boom, with your hand on their chest for the same result of like, I'm ready first. <laughs> um, and sometimes I will just, if I know someone needs it, make eye contact with them. Like, oh, I see you, you've got your hand on your chest so that they can get that validation without needing to disrupt everyone around them. <laughs> 
All right. Um, so you can go to the next slide. And so, okay, so here's a splat and some dots. And my first question to you is how many dots are on the slide? And I'm going to ask you how many, and I'm also going to ask you how you got to that number. So just, I'm going to be quiet, take a moment when you're ready, put your hand where I can see it, or if you want to do the little electronic hand raise, that's fine. Um, how many dots and how did you get to that number? Awesome. Great use of thumbs up, guys. Um, awesome. So let's see. I'm going to unmute Haley Dayberry. Haley, um, can you tell me how many dots that you see? Yeah, um, I'm worried this is like a trick question, um, but I see seven dots. Okay. Um, and how did you get there? I counted the dots. You counted them. Okay. Um, I'm going to go, oh, I'm, I'm looking at my screen and um, if you guys can do this too, I'm going to slide um, my cursor up to where it says, it might say view options. There'll be like a green bar that says you're viewing Lydia's screen. Um, this will look a little different on your, if you're on a cell phone. So I apologize for that. And then you'll have to figure it out kind of on your own. And then if you click under view options, you're going to see a list, a menu list. And under there, there'll be the option of annotate. So I want you to go ahead and click annotate and that will pop you up some drawing tools, but hang on, don't draw yet because if everyone starts drawing, we're gonna have a real mess on our screen in a minute. <laughs> but you should have some drawing tools. If you're having trouble accessing them, you can um, shoot a message to Lindsay or Gail and they'll be able to help you out, um, but don't do it yet. Um, so I'm gonna go first. When, when you counted them, so I'm gonna click, I'm clicking on draw in that bar and then there's two squiggly lines and I'm gonna pick one of them, it doesn't really matter. When you counted them, Haley, did you go like this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that the way you counted them? Can um, I counted them in a circle and then I counted the one in the middle. Awesome, so I'm gonna clear my drawings. Can you draw what you did? Um, so I started here, so one, two, three. Four, five, six. Awesome. So you got you counted one at a time to six, and then you got that middle one for seven. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Um, is there someone who did it differently, who got the same number that Haley did, or a different number, but counted in a different way than she did? All right, Megan. Uh, Haley, if you would mute yourself. Um, Megan, you, I'm going to unmute you, and if you would go ahead and show us how you counted them. Okay, so hold on, let me make sure I'm draw. So I counted them from left to right in the middle, one, two, three, and then I saw that there was four, one, two, three, four, and three and four is seven. Awesome. So, and when you, when you looked at these, did you count one, two, three, and four, or did you recognize those patterns of three and four? Yeah, I saw three in the middle and then four left over. Awesome. So that has a fancy math term. It's called, I don't know how to, subitizing or subitizing. And yes. you can see like there's um, boom three. And then many people will say, oh, I know four from the dice because the way these are happen to be laid out, they might say, I that see visual. Mm -hmm. that four and I recognize those four. So you said three plus four is seven. And we could, if we wanted to write that as an equation, right? Three plus four is seven. Oops. Whereas Haley said one plus two plus three plus four. We got, we got one plus one plus one plus one. We got up to seven that way. Great. Two really distinct ways. For time, I'm not going to keep doing this, but um, what I really love about splat, and I think Haley had this feeling too, people at the beginning are either like, Abby, this is dumb and we know how to count. Or they're like, you're trying to trick me. What, what's the secret about, this is like an optical illusion or something. 
Um, and then once we get going, they're like fascinated that every single person has a different way they counted them. If you want to start representing the expressions or talking about if you're doing a very like um, introductory level about the names of numbers, you're going to get a lot of number practice out of this one slide. Um, and people have very interesting and distinct ways. And some of them are really beautiful. Like people get interested in like the patterns of how other people saw it. Awesome, great job. Uh, we're gonna go to the net. Uh, oh, uh, so I'm gonna clear your drawings. We're gonna go to the next slide. And um, you may have to move windows around or you can just trust me. At, when she goes to the next slide, you can go one more next, yeah. Oops, wrong way, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, there we are. In the upper right hand corner, there is now a square and it has a number in it and you'll recognize that number as the number eight. So we know we that Haley and um, Megan saw um, uh, seven dots and that number is telling you that there are actually eight dots on the screen, but some of them are hidden under the splat. So take a moment when you're ready, you can put your hand where I can see it or you can raise your hand electronically. Um, and let me know, what I want you to be ready to tell me is how many dots must be under the splat. If we know there's eight, and we know how many are on the screen already. How many dots must be under this flat? And how did you get there? All right. Um, I have lost your names. Um, Let's see. Oh, good. Uh, Katie and her daughter are ready to tell us, you can unmute yourselves if you want to, are ready to tell us how many under the splat and how they got there. All right, Lily, you go. Okay. I know there's, I know there's seven and I, well, there's eight total. And so then I know there's seven uncovered. So then I know seven plus one is eight. So there must be one under the splat. That's awesome. So, oh, so you have memorized that seven plus one is eight. Yeah. Nice. That's really great. Okay. Thank you very much. That was great. Um, so um, I'm, if we had time, we would do more and we can talk about having facts memorized. We can talk about adding up or counting up or counting down and we'll see that in the next one. So can you take us to the next slide, Liddy? Uh, I did something bad and I lost my view of Liddy's. Oh, I see it now. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna have you do is I'm gonna have you think, um, and I don't know if somebody wants to put this into the chat, how many dots and how did you get there? Just how many do you see and how many, and how did you get there? And then uh, Lydia will take us to the next slide. You're welcome to take a screenshot of those questions if you want. Uh, so a slight new layer, you won't have the picture in front of you. Um, Maurice is gonna put you into very quick breakout groups. We're gonna go very briefly. And when you get in there, ask the other people in the room, how many dots do they think they saw and how do they get that number? Here's the picture again. So Marisa, you can put us into breakouts anytime. How many dots and how did you get there? Terry and Andrea, or Andrea, if you are having trouble getting into the breakout, let us know. Maybe you've stepped away. <laughs> People are just chatting their answer. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, so normally I would do a debrief with my students where I would ask you to share something that someone in your group shared about how they counted them. Um, so I might ask Rebecca to tell me someone who's in her group and then how that person counted them. Um, and I like being able to in real time in the classroom or here have someone actually write on the slide or write on some chart paper because sometimes it helps us with supporting their language and it lets me pair 
um, the language they're choosing with maybe um, an academic language that I want to target. Um, I'm not going to do that now just for the sake of time because I think you guys can imagine that. I am going to say, so now on the slide we've added the number of, um, uh, we've added the number of dots that are on the screen, um, knowing that some of them are hidden by the splat. So take a moment and think, if you know there are 13 total, how many must be under the splat and how do you know? Um, I don't want you to chant your answer right now because I want to give everyone a chance to think. So just think and when you're ready, you can put your hand on your shoulder or raise your hand or um, do a little, a little electronic hand raise. Um, as you do this activity more, you'll get early finishers. And what you can ask them is to start thinking of um, different ways to get to the number they came up with. And some students, again, they want that recognition. So I might have them, like, if you've got one way, put one thumb up. If you've got two ways, you can put two fingers up and so on. So it's just their hand on their chest. So it lets them sort of, again, get like being engaging while they're waiting for other people to finish. Um, if you've done it long enough, you might start getting strategies, like there might be something you refer to as like, oh, Rebecca's way of counting or um, the way Marisa calculated it last time. And so you might be like, well, if you did it your way, think of just a way that you saw someone do it last time that you could build on. Okay, is there someone who would like to tell us how many they think are under the splat? Penny does. Penny, did you have your hand up? I've unmuted you. Go ahead, Penny. Tell us about what you, what you think is under the spot and how you got there? Um, I knew that 13 was my total. So I, and I began by um, removing the cluster of three at the bottom and that brings me to 10, which in my mind is brain friendly. I get it to tens, the math facts get easier. <laughs> so then I had 10 and I could subtract the remaining four and that got me to six. Awesome. So I'm trying to represent, and this is way easier with chart paper, I'm trying to represent um, what you're saying here. I've got a little number line going. So I started, like you said, at 13. Here, I can annotate if you like. Yeah, go for it. And then I jumped back so to 10. I took 13 and I, I removed, well, I guess you can't see it very well. Um, you remove those three, I see that circle. Yeah, yeah. so I removed those three first. Mm-hmm. That got me to 10. And then 10 minus six in my head for whatever reason is easier than 13 minus seven. It's just the way my brain works. Um, so, th so then I was able to go 10 minus four with the remaining. So you're saying that something that's worked for you is that you have pairs that add to 10 memorized like four and six and two and eight. And that's, that's made you, yeah. that's, that's given you some strength in mathematics and that you saw that 13 take away the three, and then you dealt with the remaining four, which got you down to, you have that memorized that with, if you've got mm -hmm. 10 and you take away four, you're gonna be at six, that's great. Yeah. Um, did someone do it a different way, whether you had a different strategy or came with a different answer? I can share. Abby, we're gonna have just one more minute here. Okay, Haley, go for it. Um, I was going to say, I like to think in doubles. So I thought that seven plus seven is 14 and then uh, 14 is one more than 13. So um, there had to be six dots under the splat because there couldn't be seven. I love that. So a mathematical strength for you is to be really familiar with doubles. Um, yeah. You know, you looked for something that was close to 13. You knew there wasn't a double that made 13. You had seven and seven, and then you just compensated for that one higher, you brought it back down. And if we had time, I could, we could look at that on number line too. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, if we had time, um, you could screenshot both of their, no, their results and have students talk about similarities and differences between their strategies. You could just do like a same different about their two strategies. Um, so there's things like that that you could bring in. Um, we're we're uh, coming up against our time constraints, but at the end, if you want to talk more, um, we're eager to hang out. All right, uh, Lydia, will you go to the next slide? Yes. Uh, like many of you, I, yeah, there it is. 
Uh, and awesome. sometimes students get really into, oh, that's not how I thought the dots would be laid out. So that's a whole nother patterning conversation. Uh, you can go ahead to the next. You can go, there's, there's going to be a, a bunch. Like many of you, I over plan for the time that I have. So we could just gonna, just know that these are waiting for you for <laughs> future dreamy splat joy. Um, the way that um, Wyborny has them set up is that um, he has them in little pre-prepared slideshows. And if you look at them, there's usually a math concept that he's built them around. And you can choose to break them apart and use them your own way or use them in the way that he's set up. Um, the way that he has them set up, it flashes the kind of um, total dots before it throws the slat on. I find with my motor skills, that just causes me to reveal what the students feel like is the big reveal before time. So I cut that, slot, that, that animation out so that it doesn't reveal the, the thing until the end, but you could do it either way. Okay, Liddy, go for it, sorry. All right, so um, uh, when Abby did the debrief um, on mine, we had everybody writing on the same thing, and we wanted to try something a little bit different, and this time I've opened it up so you can see your, all the other people that are here, and I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself for just a couple minutes and tell us um, some of the things that you noticed that Abby did. Um, meanwhile, Lindsay is going to be chatting away and keeping track of everything that you say, kind of like we're in, a, in the room and she's got the big chart paper, but she's going to be doing that recording. So what are some of the things that you, that you notice? What are some of the things that um, Abby did? What academic language did she use? And are there any other things you noticed about what she did? Well, the focus of the lesson was on the thought process, not the answer. Yep. Absolutely. And I fall so, into that trap a lot where we got the answer and we move on. <laughs> yeah. um, and yeah, it, really was, it was about the thinking, not the final product. Uh -huh. Penny, how do you know that? What did she do that told you that it wasn't about the answer, but that it really was about the process? We've spent a lot of time asking people to model their different processes. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Somebody else, what else did you notice that Abby did? Um, one thing yeah. when you get the answer and then you ask someone did you find it in a different way um, gives people the power to keep thinking and I don't understand your way but I can still find it wait what that's crazy I thought I had to do it your way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's she really gets too when the students start saying Rebecca's way didn't make any sense to me and often they'll say it to me and which is a great opportunity for me to sort of step out and be like can you ask Rebecca a specific question about that or can you let her know like what point at what point you did understand it and then they can go back and forth and I can support the language. That's nice. Yep. What academic language did you hear either in numeracy or other academic kinds of language or anything else you noticed about the way Abby structured this? Things visual and then later numbers. Uh -huh. Yeah, I think that was Elizabeth. Thank you. Yep, she used both the visual and the num and the numerical representation. Great, Haley. I was going to say is um, when I explained my process, she kind of explained it back to me, but using more of that academic language than I may have used. So yep. I thought that that was really helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was it and get that good language, that very useful academic language. If they're not producing uh -huh. it, we can produce it and give it to them. Yep, absolutely. So there's some of that back and forth that is both the validating and the modeling, I think is what you're saying, right? That it validated, Haley's saying it validated what raising she said. The, or raising the thought process. <clears throat> yep, and raising yeah. it up and up in a notch. Amanda, are you something else? Hi, um, no, I just, I just like, I don't remember who said it earlier about how it was about the process, not the product. And I always find myself falling into that trap and I, I just need to step back and let them talk it out and give more people an opportunity to get the answer. It's not just the first person who gets the answer. Yep, great, absolutely. It's a lot about the process and it takes time to get there. Gail. Right. I just had two things. Um, she actually put a number line up there and had an opportunity where we could expand on it and teach a whole different math concept. Um, when I teach GED students, this is so great because often I show different ways or three different ways to meet somebody's personality and not just do a formula. So this would be a great introduction on, oh, it's okay to do all these different techniques to get an answer. Yeah. It would really build problem solving skills for future use, I think. 
Yeah, and Gail, uh, um, we can talk about this with anyone who wants to after. The splats have, you know, underneath them, algebra thinking, they have um, systems of equations. Um, so the joy, one of the joyful things about splat that I have found is that, um, I, so in my class, sometimes we come together in a group and sometimes people are all spread out individually working. And I've had multiple times where a student will, from their own independent work, look up and be like, hey, this is splat. And then two things happen. First of all, I'm like, yes. And then, <laughs> and then uh, students who are like, well, she's doing splat, but I thought she was doing really hard algebra and I can do splat. So there's this like building of like, yeah, <laughs> that's right. She's doing really hard algebra and that's splat and you can do that. So Good. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a lot of richness there and we can start to layer on like if they need to see things represented a certain way. Thank you. Um, I know that there's more that people want to say, but I want to give Abby just a quick couple minutes. We've got only about six minutes left. So um, anything that you want to make sure that we all see and do you want to go back to slides or do you just yeah, want to Yeah, would you pop us back onto the slide for a moment? Sorry, guys, I know that I want to hear all your thoughts. I know there's not enough time. Um, so um, this Steve Wyborny, and you'll get the link in the resources page and you can also message um, us. Um, oh, just take a moment and read this tweet if you would. So this is really common in my experience with splat. At the beginning, everyone is like, duh, I counted them. <laughs> or like I added them or something. And then you sort of have to um, draw out from them. But how did you do that? And at first, there's this resistance of like, I mean, that's a stupid question. Everyone has the same answer. Yeah. Um, so illuminating for them that, that um, yeah, everyone has the same answer. And look at this. Everyone's going to have a different way they got there. Um, and if you let folks answer too fast, they will all defer to whoever answered first. And if you let them um, do it pencil paper, they will all just use whatever traditional algorithm they were forced to use in school, even if it isn't the most efficient way to get there. So letting them kind of play around with that, um, it takes a little bit of like culture building. You can go to the next. Um, he has tons of splats up. This one is an example where they do fractions. I have been, um, uh, you know, we know our students are smart and we know our students aren't able to demonstrate everything they know. And I've been really pleased with how students who have had um, very little success with traditional lessons on fractions can join in the group lesson on these and talk about fractionals, how many fractional dots are under the splat in very meaningful and effective ways. Um, also, if you're looking for a way to start building number vocabulary with your students, this is a great way to talk about what fourths are and how what two fourths looks like in a very meaningful way. Um, and there's a ton of them that are really um, awesome. And literally, students will be like, can't we do more fraction splat? Um, can you take us to the next one? Uh, he also has ones that have uh, multiple splats on there. So if you want to talk about kind of X and Y variables, he has that so you could dig around. And if you ever want to play around with them with me, I, I love it. Um, okay, so um, also, um, so the, Lydia and I talked about two strategies today, but there's, there's really tons of free stuff like this online and the resource page will show you a whole bunch of it. Um, and um, a lot of you know me, I, um, I love talking about this stuff and thinking about it. So if you need someone to kick around ideas with, Seriously, and if we've never met before, I'm the person. Uh, <laughs> uh, so here's a picture. Adam Hillman is the artist, and this is linked into your resources too. And um, someone, you'll see the tweet at the bottom, tweeted this, a math teacher tweeted this, and said that they shared it with their students online, and they asked them, what fractions do you see? Mm. And then you can imagine there's a, there can be asynchronously or synchronously a conversation, like, where did you mm. see half? What do you mean two thirds? So there's a whole bunch. You can start to getting into, um, shifting into um, like a um, common denominators even in, in the conversation in a very meaningful way. Liddy pointed out to me that this slide is very hard to see for the students that are using their phone, that it looks really tiny. Um, and that may be true for some of your other pictures. So here's where I just cut a small piece of it away so that everyone could share this picture. It's the same conversation, I'm just cutting it down so that people, that if you have a lot of students using mobile, you may have to do a more zoomed in picture and then you just you know choose the one that's gonna work for your your needs. Um, if you, our students aren't ready for what fractions do you see, you can even just do what do you notice, what do you wonder. Um, and Sarah Vanderwerf, who's an awesome Minnesota math presenter, she talks about picking images that are sort of like your anchor for the beginning and end of a unit for two reasons. One is, um, so you look at this at the beginning and then ask them some notice and wonder questions. Look at it at the end, ask them some notice and wonder questions. And then you've got this sort of like um, 
uh, very visual, very um, welcoming way to, to, to look at the content and look at how much they've learned, especially if you save their notes and wonderings from the beginning. And then um, at the, if you're doing like GED review, you have this almost stack of photos that you can bring out and just put them on the table and say, what do you remember about these? Um, and they've got images that are gonna bring back up um, what they talked about in different like segmented units of your math instruction. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, next slide. Was there other? Okay. Are we I think that I think that was the end. We're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna pause here. We'll go back to that um, in a bit. We have just a couple minutes to do a, a very quick debrief on all of it. Um, and so my our big question is, what benefits can you imagine um, for any of these things with your students? And you know, holler out any ideas you have. Um, can you imagine any benefits for of these things with your students? I think a big benefit would be that they're actually using a thinking process and just instead of just trying to come up with a number, which might be frustrating to them. And so I think it gets them in that thinking mode, which helps in all of math and it helps in all of language. So, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Betsy. Anybody else? Other ideas? What other benefits could you imagine with your students? Um, I think it's very empowering to be a student and to know that y your way of thinking is different, but like it's helping someone else and it's okay to be different than memorizing the steps that you failed you before. So, sure. I mean, just like, oh, I did mine a really cool way can just get like excitement going or being yep. told your way was really cool. Yep. Yes. And um, I would add to that, that I got to a point where I knew that the students making mistakes was good, but it sounded like BS when I told my students that, you know, that they didn't believe it. And um, I was like, how do I shift that culture? Like, what do I do to show them that, that mistakes are cool? And your example is really good where I'm like, oh, I can build on the thinking you had there. Or if another student can be like, even if they didn't get the right answer, oh, I did it the way that Rebecca started, you know, like that is really powerful. Um, I kind of, I like it that, I, well, I've noticed with students, they love it or they really respond when everyone drops their jaw because they think, they think wow, you did it like that? I would never have done that. Yeah. Yeah, I see a lot of people nodding their heads. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Great. Thank you. Um, what looks hard and what challenges do you see here in, in using any of these with your in your setting or with your students? I, I think um, my students are the I develop professional development for adult um, ESL instructors. And so I think there would have to be a lot of um, language building and a lot of, of scaffolding um, this yep. language because the, the classes they teach aren't traditionally math classes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's great and it would, you know, obviously provide them with a wealth of new vocabulary, but there definitely would have to be a lot of building there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when I started my estimation 180 stuff, I started with a, quite a long language lesson about estimate, estimate, estimation, what, how we use all of those words, how they're different, how we pronounce them differently, and then we practice and review even just that, just the language of, of that every time. So yeah, there's a lot of building and scaffolding, of course, that goes into this. Yeah, thank you. Somebody else, um, what other, any other challenges? I know some of you are writing it in the chat. That's great too, thank you. Just, <clears throat> I just think that anytime you're starting something new with students, there's resistance. And so just being patient with your students and with yourself and putting it into your routine somewhere and being consistent, they will come around, um, but not expecting it to be like, you know, lightning in a bottle the first time you try it. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, Megan, that reminds me also that, um, you know, we, we say to our students and in these activities, we, we in, ex, implicitly say mistakes are great. We learn from our mistakes. And I think that we also have to say that to ourselves, that I'm going to try this. It may work okay-ish and it may not. And we learn from our mistakes and then we just keep going with it until we get better and better at it. And then it's, if it's, exactly. worth, trying, well, it's worth trying three times to make it a little bit better and to get the routines a little bit better. That also um, might be, we did, uh, and I think Lydia and I both did this, we, we did it like 20 minutes for each of our, 20 minutes, like once a week for a while, we just made a commitment to ourselves to do that 
at that rate. And my students are coming, going, so I always have students that haven't done it yet with us. I'm like, oh, you've never done Splat. Can someone tell her what Splat's about? But 20 minutes once a week was the investment that I agreed to make to myself. Um, and then, you know, you can ramp it up or ramp it down once you're sort of like, oh, this is working or I've worked up a kinks or whatever. Yeah. Well, um, and I can't remember is, who you said the quote was from, Abby, but like you said at the beginning, I'm doing the best I can and it's evolving, right? <laughs> Exactly. And, and I want to just point out two, two comments and put them together. Uh, Elizabeth Bennett says, it's such a different approach to doing math more than what most students are used to. What do you mean I have to talk and write words? And then Christine's um, response of, like, if we explain why we're asking students to do what we're asking them to do, it can go a long way. So yeah. I just wanted to point those out. Yeah, and I, when I do SWAT, because it's one room schoolhouse, I don't necessarily say, like, it's time to do some math, which I think it has a value. Like, there's a students who don't think of themselves as math people have a really good time with Splat and then are all suddenly like, oh my gosh, I know lots of math things. Right. All right, um, I'm sorry to cut this conversation short because um, I know that we probably could go quite a bit further, um, but we do need to wrap up. So um, we're gonna go back to a couple things. Um, and let's see, um, we're gonna ask you for feedback. So um, this feedback form is gonna come to you in your, uh, let's see, it's in the, chat i believe right and yep. it'll be sent to you as well um there are more details about this uh what are the other details when you when you get when you do the feedback then you will get um access to the slideshow and all the other resources and i think you'll also get your ceus when you when you do this as well it will be sent to you but it, you know giving us feedback is really helpful um and then uh we don't really have more time for questions. Um, but, you know, like Abby said, we are in a funny time here and there's a lot of places that you all could have been this morning and we are so glad that you chose to be here with us. So thank you, thank you so much. Don't leave yet, there's more. Patsy, and, is this uh, you? After Patsy oh. or, or I think Marisa is done, Lydia and I are gonna stay on the call. So if you want to stick around and talk about bringing the math forward or any other questions or share ideas about how you'd modify it, we'd love to, you're welcome to stay. Great, thank you. And thank you, like high fives from me to, to our presenters and everyone who contributed in the chat box and in your small groups. Really appreciate everyone's time this morning. What a great webinar, thank you so much. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. If you don't know already, uh, there is a Schoology group around COVID-19 where this is the place where people are sharing information right now. And um, I encourage you to become a member of that group if you haven't already. Uh, the um, link to an article, a little bit more about it and instructions on how to get involved uh, with that group have just been chatted out from Gail. So thank you for that. On the next slide, we just have a few announcements of things that are coming up. Um, there are lots and lots of things to keep aware of. And one of the best ways to do that is to um, get your newsletter, which you should be getting every Tuesday morning in your in your inbox. Um, if not, go to our website at lsabe.org and sign up for the newsletter. Uh, this is where you can find out about all the upcoming events, as well as some really fantastic articles coming out from practitioners like you around the state who are taking the time to just write down what's working, what's not, how it's evolving uh, as it came up today. So be sure and, and tune into that. Um, some resources, of course, on our website as well. And then finally, we have some upcoming webinars we just wanted to point out on the next slide. We've been hosting coffee breaks. If you haven't been to one yet, please do. These are informal ways to just stay connected during these distance times. And we've been organizing them around certain themes with um, people around the, the state who have this topic as their wheelhouse. And so we have one coming up on One Room Schoolhouse, another on mental health, another math one with Lindsay. Wave, Lindsay. There she is. Um, and then um, more on ESL from Andrea, English Language Arts with Christine. So a time to come together with people you, you may be familiar with already, who you know are experts in their fields, and then to share with others who are, who are doing the work that you are doing. Relicensure um, CEUs are available for webinars and you can see the list of those that are coming up. There are a couple just next week even, so join us for those. Again, read your newsletter. That's the message I guess I have for you. <laughs> Thank you so much to Abby and Liddy for all of their work. If you haven't yet figured out the little reaction thing to give them um, applause, everyone try that right now. I think that would be amazing. So it's down below. Uh, you kind of hover over the bottom of your screen uh -huh. and if you can like clap, let's see how many people we can have clap. Awesome. awesome. I love it. Thank you. Everybody. Fantastic. All right. Thanks everybody. Um, and I think Lydia and Abby are going to stick around for a little bit if you have further questions or just want to spend time with them because they're lovely people. Um, please do. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. I also put my um, email in the chat if um, you don't get something that you wanted to get or you have questions on. later. Oh, what's going on there? <laughs>
Christine has turned purple uh, for the day. We're not sure why. So <laughs> we wanted to be a blobfish, Christine. I don't have the faintest did. idea why that happened. <laughs> go ahead. You're go a on. nice shade of magenta right now. It suits you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Megan's daughter, hello. Yes, it's lovely to see your children and your pets. We appreciate you and all of that she you're doing. She couldn't stay away. I told them, yeah, I told them they had until 1030 and then she couldn't stay away. So <laughs> she is always welcome at a Just webinar you. near you. That is awesome. Thanks, Thanks awesome. everybody. Thank you. I'm surprised. Thank you so much. Oh, Christine's back. Okay. Yeah, I totally forgot. <laughs>